Turn to book of Revelation with me this morning, please. Chapter 1. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 1. Revelation chapter number 1 and verse 1. The divine text says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bare record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy holy name, Father, amen. You can be seated. No other book in the Bible promises you a blessing simply to read it apart from the book of Revelation. We believe the book of Revelation closes the canon of Scripture. So what does that mean, preacher? It means the last inspired book of the Bible. Anything written afterward is simply the product of men or could be the product of devils. But the book of Revelation closes the canon of Scripture. The book of Revelation was written somewhere about 90 to 95 A.D. under the reign of Domitian, a Roman emperor. The book of Revelation, therefore, is written on up into the time as the New Testament church was beginning to experience persecution and growing and seeing the salvation of many into its ranks. The book of Revelation answers some questions that no doubt were on the mind of many Christians that lived in this time. For example, a monster lived in Rome by the name of Nero. He was one of their, uh, he was one of their Caesars. Nero executed his own mother. Nero set fire to Rome and blamed the Christians. Nero set fire to Christians and used them to light up his orgies as he performed them in his mansion and his castle. Nero was a monster. So therefore, he had personally persecuted many Christians. No doubt, fresh in the mind of those believers was what had happened to their brothers and sisters, and maybe possibly where was the Lord God when all of this was happening to them? Where was Christ? Where was he? Where was his promises? Where was the one who said that I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee? The apostle Peter wrote them an epistle, and he said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that shall try some of you as though some strange thing has happened. God's people for 2,000 years have endured persecution at the hands of the state, of unbelievers, at the hands of other religions, at the hands of other so-called Christians. Our brothers and our sisters have been persecuted. And to this very day, right now, at this moment, while I'm speaking to you this morning, all over this globe, brothers and sisters in Christ are dying for their faith in the Son of God, thus becoming martyrs for my Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not a strange thing that God's people have been put to the sword because of their faith in the Son of God. The book of Revelation, finding its place, it completes the canon of Scripture. The book of Genesis is the first book of the Bible in the beginning. The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. The word revelation is translated from the Greek word apocalypsis, which means an unveiling, an opening up, a preview, if you please, a looking into the future. What's coming down the pike? What can we expect? into the future. And the book of Revelation is the one of the books of the Bible that spans a great deal of time because it has to do not only with the creation. Revelation chapter number 1 verse 8. Revelation chapter number 1 he said I'm the Alpha and the Omega the beginning and the ending but it has to do with eternity. For in eternity this great white throne that has judged all of mankind will judge man and he'll send into eternity those that know God. And then those that don't know God will be turned into hell fire and damnation. The book of Revelation spans out into a broad spectrum of what God intends to do with all of creation. This is why men don't like the book of Revelation. 
because it gets down to the nitty gritty of where we came from, what makes us think the way we do, why we are the way we are, and where we are headed. The book of Revelation is a book written by the Apostle John. The Apostle John wrote three books in the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, he wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and he wrote the book of Revelation. In the Gospel of John, he said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. In 1st John, he said, in him was life, he is the life of God. Then in the book of Revelation, he said in chapter number one and verse 80, he, verse number eight, he is the almighty. He's almighty God. So three times the apostle John puts his stamp on the statement that the Lord Jesus Christ is God almighty. He wants you to know who he is. And if we miss that point, you might as well take the Bible and throw it away because you're going to miss everything that it's talking about. This is a book about him, not me. It's not about men. It's not about good works. It's not about that. It's about the Son of God. And we've got to get him right. So the book of Revelation starts out by saying it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice that it's about a vision that God gives him. In chapters number 4 and 5, he's caught up into the third heaven. While there, he sees things that you literally cannot understand. The apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12 was caught up into the third heaven. And by the way, you need to understand this today. The only way that you can go into the third heaven is for a door to open up and allow you to enter in to the third heaven. You'll never reach there physically. You can never go there by a spaceship. I don't care if you can do whatever it's impossible, humanly impossible today to even think of. You could never approach the throne of God. It can only be reached when a door is opened up in heaven. Let me tell you who that door is. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. The great I am's of the Lord Jesus Christ make up the gospel of John. He is everything that your soul is searching for today. And it should be searching. Unless you are a dog or a cat, unless you're a hog lying somewhere with a slop trough and you're satisfied just to eat, and breathe, you should be thinking. You should be concerned about where you came from and where you're going. God made you a lot higher than the animals. He gave you a brain. He gave you the thought of eternity in your soul. He put it deep down inside your thinking. You think about things that you can't see. That's abstract thought. You think about things that you've never seen, and yet you wonder about them. You wonder about eternity. You wonder about the future. You wonder about what lies beyond the grave. No cow, no dog, no cat concerned with that. They're simply organic beings that live out their lives, die, and their body is put in the ground. And the Bible says the spirit of the animal goes down into the earth but the spirit of a man goes back to God who gave it you came down from above what lives inside your soul today originated from the very essence of almighty God this is what makes us so different this is why we are so so restless this is why we want to know so many things this is why man is constantly exploring sending stuff up inspecting this exploring that he wants to know, and the reason he wants to know is because God put that knower in you. So the book of Revelation is about the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's about heaven. The Bible says that there's a great, huge throne up there in glory. He said in the Bible, the Old Testament, he said, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where can you contain God? Where can you measure him? How can you understand him? By what measurement would you measure the almighty today. Oh, I've got him all figured out, preacher. You are one arrogant soul. You don't have a clue what you're talking about. I don't have him figured out. I know that he is eternal. I know he's invisible. I know he's from everlasting to everlasting. And I know the only way to know him is through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and I know, thank God, I know him. The only way you'll ever know the Lord Jesus Christ is through the path of sin. You'll acknowledge that you're a sinner. You'll acknowledge that your sins have condemned you. And you'll acknowledge that he is the only remedy for your sin. You'll come to him as a condemned sinner. You'll cry out to him for mercy. And his blood will cleanse your sins away. That's the only way you'll ever be able to approach into the presence of God is a redeemed sinner. So he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the first and I'm the last. Who would you reckon unto me? Who would you like unto me to? Go ahead and carve out something. Go ahead and make something, paint something. Whatever you conceive God to be, you've come up far, far short. So the Bible said a door was opened in heaven. Jesus is the door. He said, I saw a sea of glass. And upon that sea of glass, he said, I saw a throne. And before that throne, he said, I saw 24 elders. And then there were four beasts gathered around the throne. But the thing to consider about is this. They ceased not night and day, 24-7, constantly over and over. They cried because they came before him and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. One day that holiness will flood your soul. One day holiness will engulf you like light. One day you'll experience holiness, holiness like you never have before. You'll come into the presence of an eternal God that is from everlasting to everlasting. You'll see creation, then you'll see the creator and it'll flood your soul and you'll worship like all the rest have worshiped. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, a throne on a sea of glass. It must have been transparent. Here he is suspended in his own creation because he doesn't need his creation. And his creatures are gathered before him and they give glory to him. Well, what do you think this little old piece of dirt down here is going to do? This little blue piece of dirt that was taken from a dung hill. How my friend was born in 1946 and showed up on this earth. Why, my friend, have you got any idea how many people lived and died before I ever showed up? Do you understand how long human history has been on this earth? before this little insignificant nothing showed up in 1946 and yet he came down to my soul. He came down and called me. He came down and convicted me and he saved my soul and wrote my name in the Lamb's book of glory to God. What a God. Hallelujah to God. Amen. What a God we serve that he would come and call my name. The apostle Paul said, he separated from me my, from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. Glory to God. I want you to know that I'll take my place one day with the billions that have met on high as they sing the redeemed, the songs of the redeemed. Hallelujah. Born again, saved, washed in the blood of the son of God. You say these words are offensive to me, preacher. I'm a religionist. I'm a good person. I'm righteous. I do good deeds. I know you do. But it won't buy you one half second in the presence of God. It'll send you to hell in a heartbeat. The only one that can keep you out of the pit is the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's who John's talking about. I get the strangest feeling that John loved him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I get a feeling that he loved him while he was here on this earth. John the apostle laid his head on his breast. John laid his head on his breast. He was, the Bible said, the apostle whom Jesus loved. He loved all of them, but there must have been a peculiar, particular love that he had for John. And my friend, he had John set apart after all the other apostles had quit writing, after the scripture had been completed save one book. The apostle John was called out to be the one who completed the canon of scripture the last apostle to write the word of God was the apostle John do you know what the word John means by the way the word John means beloved <laughs> Beloved, beloved of God. John's a good name, folks. You name your kids John, you won't go wrong. Amen. So the book of Revelation talks about a door opened in heaven. I want to go to heaven, don't you? I want to go in the presence of God one day, don't you? I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to burn forever. I don't want to go down. I want to go up, don't you? Don't you? 
Do you want to go up or do you want to go down? Do you want to go out in the presence of God Almighty where he liveth forever and ever and ever? Where he creates new universes and new worlds. Where all he has to do is say the word and the thing you've never thought of comes into existence. Angels marvel at the creator. It's never crossed their mind what he's able to do when he hung upon that cross and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He had complete control over life and death. They never took his life from him. He gave it to the Father. Here is one who says, I live, you live. I live, you live. Here is one who walks on the water. He says the word and dead men come forth. He's the one that can touch my friend, the, la the, 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 uh, the leper, and my friend that can be healed by the power of God. And yet he cannot be contaminated himself. He cannot be perverted himself. In the Old Testament, the priest could not touch a leper. They could be contaminated by doing that, but you cannot contaminate the Son of God. Why, preacher? Because he was holy. As he lived among us, he lived a holy, pure life. If you start walking with God and talking with God, get yourself a prayer room. Get yourself serious with the Lord. Get serious about your faith. Quit giving lip service to your God. Quit, quit, my friend, all this blather coming out of your mouth and have something happen to your soul. You'll be amazed at how holiness will begin to settle down on you. That doesn't mean that you're good. It doesn't make you better than other people, but it begins to build a wall, a wall of separation that they cannot cross over. You're not contaminated as much with the filth and slime and garbage that you're going to walk out into in just a few minutes. You're going to walk out into hell. The minute you walk out that back door, you're walking into a filthy sewer. You got that? That's all that is. But if you walk in the light as he is in the light, you have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses you from all sin. Yes, hallelujah. There's a holy separation that takes place. So many people think that separation means I quit this and I quit that and I quit. No, it's nothing you do. Separation has to do with what he does in you. It's a work of grace that's worked in your soul when he begins to build a wall between you and this filthy world that you live in. Oh, Revelation's a beautiful book. He said, I was caught up into the third heaven. Notice what he said in chapter number four and verse number two. He said, I saw a throne in heaven. The book of Revelation mentions the word throne far more than any book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Why, preacher? Because it's about the throne. It's about the glorified Christ. It's about him that liveth forever and ever and ever and ever. Isaiah saw the throne in chapter number six and verse number one. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. God gave Isaiah a vision of a throne. It was that vision of the throne of God and the glory of God and seraphim flying as a ball of fire crying, holy, 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 that put a fire inside the soul of Isaiah and set him apart. Ezekiel saw a throne in chapter number one and verse number 26. He saw a throne and he saw man upon that throne and the throne had wheels. When Israel was carried off into captivity, God was letting them know, I am still God. You might be in captivity right now. Some of you may be in slavery and bondage to something. Satan may be beating you to death. He may be wearing you out, but you're too proud to let anybody know it. You're too proud to even ask for prayer. But deep down inside your soul, you're dying. And you wonder, how can I get any help? Let me tell you who will help you. Let me tell you somebody loves you like nobody loves you. Let me tell you about Jesus. All you got to do is find your place and cry out. <coughs> and say, Lord Jesus, help me. And he'll help you. Oh, he'll help you. He'll help you. Daniel saw a throne. Yes, he did. In Daniel chapter number seven, verse number nine, he said, the ancient of days set up on that throne. I like the way the Lord Jesus is mentioned in the Bible as the ancient of days. Oh, I like that one in Revelation. He said, thou art the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending. Somebody said, why, preacher, don't you know that God created Christ? You've been going to the Jehovah's Witnesses too long. 
You've been running around with a bunch of, with a bunch of rank heretics. God did not create Jesus Christ. God incarnated himself in flesh and was known as Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, yes. But, oh, yes, Daniel saw the Ancient of Days on the throne. And then in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse 11, John said, I saw a great white throne. Notice the times the thrones are mentioned from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away. Can you get that in your mind? Can you see in your mind what the Bible just told you? The Bible just said that there is a great white throne and that the whole creation can't stand before him. Why, preacher? Because his holiness comes out. Holiness separates. Holiness pushes creation away. Holiness builds walls. Are you listening to me? Holiness ensures and secures. Holiness takes hold of and protects. And this is why the Bible said, Be ye holy even as I am holy. And the holiness comes from the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And so the heavens and the earth get a glimpse of his holiness. And they say, I can't handle this. And away they go. But you that are born again by the grace of God, you're drawn to it. Amen. 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 Lift your head up from the hog trough for a moment. Raise your head up for the diamonds in the sky. Look at the stars in the heavens. Look up above you. That's where you came from. That's what you're living for. Satan's got you down here and he's got your head pushed down. He walks over you as you feed from the trough and he just pushes it on down in the slop and says, enjoy it. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. I'm your Lord. I'm your master. Black Friday came. Women were fighting each other over dolls, rolling in the floors, pulling their hair, hitting each other. My, is that what Christmas is about? What a shame. What a disgrace. But that's exactly where Satan wants us, to turn the whole nation into a nation of animals. And that's exactly where they are today, to scratch and claw and fight over something that is here today and gone tomorrow. Abraham, look up above. Yes, Lord. See the stars in the heavens, Abraham? Yay, I see them. Go ahead. Start counting them. Yeah. Now, Lord, I'm a believer, but you done set a task before me here I ain't ever going to be able to fulfill. What do you mean, count them? Why, they're innumerable. It's beyond my ability. No human can count that. Abraham, you ever been to the sea? Yeah, Lord, I've been there, Mediterranean. Look at all that sand underneath your feet. Yeah, Lord, he's count every grain of it. Go ahead count it all. Lord, you're messing with my mind now. Abraham, because you took your son, you took him to the top of Moriah, you have done this great thing. I'm going to make you the father of all the faithful. There's never going to be another on the face of the earth that is the father of all the faithful. I'm a son of Abraham this morning because I am one who believes like he did. Abraham, because you believe me, you look into the heavens, you believe me about the sand beneath the, your feet. He said, I will count that to you for righteousness. Yes. So he did. So that's Abraham, not you too. Amen. You can believe him before you walk out the back door this morning. Amen. You can believe him. Yep. Lord, I believe, but help me. I need my faith increased. Help my unbelief. God will help your unbelief. God doesn't raise up some great champions here who have great faith where others don't. The source of our faith is the same for every one of us. Do you believe? I believe. And man, what a difference it makes in my life. John saw the throne. God's glorified. He's in control. And he's worshiped. Now I'm going to close with these statements in here this morning about the Lord Jesus that it says in Revelation. I mean, folks, I can't preach the whole book. How many of you want me to preach the whole book? We'll be here about midnight. <laughs> but I am going to preach this about Christ because that's who it's about. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
I've got seven things here I want to mention to you this morning. Revelation chapter number one, he's the Almighty. Who said that preacher? John did. Do you believe John? Revelation chapter number five and verse number six, he's called the Lamb of God. Think about it now. A lamb as it had been slain with his throat cut, yet he's opening the book. Why? Because in God's son's weakness, he was crucified in weakness. He was crucified giving himself completely for us. God raised him from the dead. And when he did that, he gave him all power in heaven and in earth. Amen. Amen. And then it says in Revelation 1.13, he was the one who walks in the midst of his church. I'm so glad he came in here this morning. Because the death angel met with us first. And then Revelation 5, verse 9, he's the object of worship. Worthy is the Lamb. Revelation chapter number 19, verse 11, he's the coming one. Behold, I saw heaven and open. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make peace. Did I mess up? What's he say? He makes war, folks. The Prince of Peace is not coming back to offer peace to the world. He's coming back to destroy the armies of hell and bring peace with him. In Revelation chapter number 20 and verse 11, I saw a great white throne and he that sat upon it for whose face the heavens and the earth fled away. He's the judge because it's the Lord Jesus on that throne. Say, preacher, is he going to judge me? He's already judged me. He judged me and found me guilty. I've done been judged. God doesn't have double jeopardy. <laughs> done been judged. You know, you know where the, the U.S. Constitution got the idea of not having double jeopardy? Now, if you're in Italy, you could be tried four or five times for the same thing. At least that's what I understand. But not here. If you've been exonerated in the court of law, you've been tried, and you've been exonerated, they cannot try you again for the same offense. That's double jeopardy. Well, I've done been tried. I've done been found guilty. I've done been sentenced to hell. And the sentence was going to be carried out. But he stepped in my place and said, I'll take it for him. So they can't try me again. And then finally, Revelation 22, verse 12. Let's turn there and I'll close with that one this morning. This is a beautiful passage. Some passages in the Bible are just plum beautiful. Revelation 22 and verse 12. 13 and then 16. Revelation 22, 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. To give every man according as his work shall be. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Here's another way of saying that. I'm the eternal one. Then in verse 16, he said, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. Now watch this. The bright and morning star. That's beautiful. But he's beautiful. Everything about him is beautiful. Amen. Amen. Everything about the Lord Jesus Christ is beautiful. Yes. I've never found a thing about him that isn't beautiful. Amen. Everything I've ever learned about him fires my soul and increases my faith in him. He's wonderful. He'll be with you in the darkest hour of your life. He'll be with you when you think you're going to die. And nobody else can do a thing to help you. He'll be with you. He'll be with you when you've come to the end of your road and sin has finally gotten you to where you, he got your attention. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. He'll be with you. He'll be with you when your wife leaves you, when your husband leaves you, when your children leave you, when you get fired from your job, when everybody in the world leaves you and turns their back on you and there's nowhere else to go, he'll be with you. He said, I will never, ever, 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 ever leave you. He'll be with you. He is faithful. Do you remember the last time I preached in here on Sunday morning? Where it says, though we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. 
I can stick with you as long as it's humanly possible. I can try to be there as a friend and a comfort and a help as long as it's humanly possible. But folks, a human being is bound up, has limitations, can only go so far. He can go with you when all the rest of the family is told by the doctor, you go over to the waiting room now and I'll come out and see you when I get done. I'm a pastor that's been at this a long time, and I've gone into that waiting room with families when they didn't know if their loved one was going to come out or not. And then the doctor would come out and have a smile on his face and say everything's okay. But I've been there when the doctor came out, and he was just kind of looking down at the ground and said, I'm sorry, we did everything we could, but we couldn't save him. But I don't care who you are, he'll go with you all the way into the room through the doors on the bed and past what the anesthesiologist can do, past what the surgeon can do, past what the nurses can do, he'll go with you all the way to the end. When I come to the river of Jordan, I want to be able to put my foot down into that river. I want to be able to touch it like those did in the Old Testament. And when I touch the river of Jordan, it stops and opens up. What does that mean, preacher? That means death cannot touch you. And when you touch that river, you walk across, and he'll be waiting for you on the other side. And he'll be with you as you go through, and your loved ones. Some of you will have a daddy. Some of you will have a mother. Some of you will have a wife. Some of you will have a husband. Some of you will have a little girl. I've been out there, caskets about this big, or a little boy. And you haven't seen them in 10 years, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. And the moment you cross that river, there they stand with their little smiling faces Amen. and say, welcome home, mommy. Yeah. Welcome home, daddy. Yeah, right. Welcome home, husband. Welcome home, wife. I've always loved you. I always will love you. Now I can love you forever and it'll never be broken. No graveyards. No sickness, no sorrow, no death. It'll be the love of God shed abroad down upon your soul. A pure love, a perfect love that cannot be tainted. There's nothing that I could ever think of any greater than that. I'll see a man who was born while Jesse James was still robbing banks. And he raised me and died in 1969. And when I cross that Jordan, I'll see him standing right there waiting for me. You don't think heaven and home will be a welcome home? Amen. The only way you'll ever make it to where I'm talking about is through the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. Please understand me. There is no way into heaven but by the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your holy word. In Jesus' name I ask it. Thank you for coming in here. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for breaking the power of hell that came down upon us. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for blessing your word. As somebody in this house this morning, Lord, are going to receive something. They're going to get something from God. They're not going to be cheated again. They're not going to walk out this door in the same shape they came in. They're going to get something from God. They're going to do it now. They're going to cry out to you. They're going to call upon you. They're tired. They're sick and tired of the mess that their life's in. They want something good. I pray for them. I pray that they won't let Satan defeat them another day. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and sing, brother. Will you?